One thing I noticed also was you would compose and present daily briefings to the director of the NSA. Yep. So this is the person who is basically the chief executive of the National Security Agency. And this is where I'm starting to see maybe some of your writing came into play a well, little bit. Well, it did. And so from, from, my, er, and from my earliest days, uh, again, you're only 22, 23-ish when you're a first lieutenant. Um, I was writing the briefings uh, and, and delivering them as in actually vocalizing it the following morning to the director of the National Security mm. Agency. Um, and, and so when you're, when you're addressing an audience of that magnitude, of that, of that rank, you truly have to know how to make every single word count and every second has to say something. So mm. that's I, I learned from the earliest days um, of how to leverage time and space to be able to communicate at that level. I get time because you're saying, I Not, can't waste a second. Every word has to really mean something. Mm-hmm. I, don't mean, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by leveraging space. Okay, space. So, so I describe this. If you can imagine, imagine now uh, a white rectangle, okay? So... So every, every writer, no matter what you're composing, uh, you're, lever- you're, you're uh, constricted by time and space. Time, tick, tick, I'm busy. The general's busy. Uh, you're busy. And space is, uh, if you're having to write like above the fold on a web page, or if there's a form that you're filling out and there's actually a demarcated lo- uh, space on the form you, where you have only that space in which to make your case, uh, or if you're writing a grant and you have five pages tops to present your, your position, uh, or describe your article in 130 characters, mm. including spaces, all of that is when I say space. Mm. So, so the, the person who leverages time and the physical space in order to convey your message usually wins. And in order to do that well, you, know how, you need to know how to write to influence. And so that's where my writing methodology and my word sculpting techniques come in. Word sculpting word techniques. Sculpting you're, techniques. Not even using, you're not even saying word smith. You're using no, word, word sculpt. sculpting. What is the difference between word sculpting versus word smithing? Complete difference. Complete Teach difference. Me. Okay. So, so imagine right now that you are a sculptor. So you're sitting in Paris. You've got the beret and the Michelangelo. Smock. Exactly. Boom. And in front of you, you're facing an eight foot gra- uh, block of granite. Yes. Because you are a master sculptor, you know the image that lies dormant in that, in that granite. So you Ooh. take out your tools and chisel, 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 and poop. You got all the rubble on the ground, and there's your statue. Word sculpting is the same thing. Except instead of instead of having a block of, of marble, you have your first draft. So part two of my book, Right to Influence, I have ten word sculpting techniques mm. where you go you go sentence by sentence, and uh, some of them are uh, useless words. You identify the useless words that contribute nothing to the sentence, uh, words that hog space, where you combine three or four words into one, mm-hmm. or, or if you're space constrained, you learn how to use shorter words instead of the longer words. Mm-hmm. Uh, find and expunge redundancy. So there's there's ten word sculpting tools that I provide, and 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 that's how you take your draft and you hone it into that hard hitting concise message. But but these are the these are what I didn't know. I mean, I, I was writing like that, but I didn't know that I was writing like that in the early days. Right. You and were kind of doing it intuitively, instinctively, yeah, learning just, along the just way. Just because it was, it was in me. It was right. a gift. It was in me. So, uh, you know, I'd mentioned during, at the leading into your economic, your business meeting, that the writing shitty is part a of the fundamental, show? yeah, <laughs> I didn't say that, fundamental leadership <laughs> skill. Here's how that came to pass. Um, when I was a lieutenant colonel, I was a squadron commander. What that means is that I was in charge of a unit that had 480 really talented young men and women. This was in Hawaii. In Hawaii? In Hawaii. And was this all intelligence? A squ- it, it, squadron it was, of it was intelligence? the 324th Intelligence Squadron. By the way, when we say intelligence, can I picture a room like NASA or these, these, these military rooms where a bunch of people are sitting in front of computers, rows and rows of people? Um, and they're no, all. No, it, it 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 can vary. I mean, it, it could, could be, be that cubicles. Or just, what? It could be cubicles. Yeah, just you know, office. It's a office. business. Okay. Anyway, so when I when I got to the three twenty fourth, um, I discovered it was the most losing unit in the whole island for statewide 
annual, a quarterly and annual professional awards. These were oh. the awards that were really important for the bullets for performance reports and getting ah. promoted. And, and I had the unit that was just a joke because they last. lost dead all last. the time. All the dead time. last. They uh, gave you the dead last. They, they lost wow. all the time. And what I discovered... By the way, what's an example of one of the awards you could win that helps us understand like uh, what were they competing? Air, air, okay, think, think ranking. Yeah, junior officer of the quarter... Airman of the quarter, sergeant of the quarter. Got it. Okay. Got and it. And these are all these. It's not sports awards. These were all based on on the merits of how you performed for that particular time period. Yes. Okay. So what I learned is it's not that my guys didn't deserve to win because they were talented folks. Mm. The problem was one level up, their bosses couldn't write. So so you could be the best staff sergeant that God ever invented. But because somebody couldn't write your accomplishments, the sergeant's boss, you lose. Yeah. Okay. All because somebody didn't know how to write. Wow. So I took I took three days personal time, sequestered myself in a beach cabin, and I analyzed my writing. So I asked myself, Carla, what? This is this is when you took over the the yeah. squadron. Yep. You started actually studying your writing. Yep. Wow. Okay. So I, I took the three days and and I asked, okay, so Carla. You do something that works because whenever I wrote packages in my previous assignment, my guys always won. So it's what do you do and how do you do it and how do you teach other people? So out of that three days came my word sculpting techniques. So I turned that into a, oh. a, a like a 20 page really rough handbook and I, I gave it to everybody. And the first person to whom I handed it, I saw him put a cup of coffee on it. I thought, well, crap. Coaster. That's, that's not going to work. <laughs> so I turned it into a one-hour workshop, and uh. I taught them how to write. And all of a sudden, we started sweeping the awards. Is that right? Fourth. Yeah. The, I've got a picture. I took a picture all those years ago of the first time. Uh, there was a huge billboard at Hickam Air Force Base that would announce who the winners were. 324, 324, 324. We swept Swept the, from last to From first. last to first, and we became the unit to beat because I taught them how to write. Would they? But, but would, would, meaning you teach the the the, the bosses mm -hmm. of them how to write so that they can have a chance at winning this because they were they were good. So they so they could tell the stories of their right. wonderful subordinates wow. in a way. So you structure their message. You figure out how to add the de detail. And, and how to bring tears to the reader's eyes. And it's all about knowing how, how to frame and how to convey the message. So I ended up, I ended up teaching uh, my technique in the Air Force for the next 15 years to thousands of people. Because I had no idea how vacuous the need was. And that was, you know, that was, uh, I retired in 2006. And that was before Twitter and Facebook mm. and, and the academic systems now some time ago, actually uh, stopped, start, I'm sorry, stopped teaching people how to write wow. really well. So the need now is more demanding than ever before. Ubiquitous than it was back then. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I see. And the lesson I learned out of all that, my battle cry, is that powerful writing changes lives. Wow. Because it does. Wow, you really believe that? I do. I it, can see it in your eyes. It, it opens doors to opportunity. You could be the best, but if your resume is better, you know, somebody else's resume is better. He gets hired, better, right. He gets hired. You don't. Right. Sucks to be you, and right. it sucks to be the company that was hiring, because you would have been the better choice. Right. Sucks to be the company, too. Right. right. They exactly. got the second choice. So, so I teach people to, I empower them, actually, by leveraging their own words to open doors to opportunity. Hmm. Mm. And all of that is why le uh, powerful writing is a, a fundamental leadership skill. Because if, if you can't make a case to keep your budget from getting cut, um, to making a case for, hey, I've got this new mission, I want more resources, and here's why you need to give me more resources, you know, expanding your empire, uh, promoting the right people, um, putting out the ads and so forth, marketing the company so that you attract the talented people. If you can't make a case for all of those things, you know, you, you handicap yourself just because you can't write well. Are there instances where that powerful tool can actually be used in a manipulative way? Meaning someone learns to powerfully write um, and they're the most convincing, yet... Um, well, I guess this is what we're saying. Like, my, my worry is this, that someone writes their way into a job. You know, they, they, they don't actually deserve that job. Well, I think what 
how would you respond to that? Um, I, guess, I guess the answer is yes. I mean, you see people padding resumes all the time. Right. Um, so it's up to the reader, the interviewer, the, the company to... You know, Determine whether that's the truth or not. Yeah. So I mean, the, okay, so we're differentiating... Thank you. So we're differentiating awesome, you know, powerful writing versus dishonest writing. What? Meaning you can have powerful, dishonest mm-hmm. writing... Um, and, and that is now a moral issue mm-hmm. that needs to be, uh, you know, snuffed out by, yep. by someone. So, yep. So when, when I teach people, here's how you write powerful input for your own performance report, or when you're writing a performance report on one of your subordinates, I teach you how to write powerfully, but that presumes that you're going to write honestly. Mm. So I say, no fair taking a mediocre performance and applying all of my writing techniques to exaggerate it to something that it shouldn't be. Okay. All right? But that's no fair. Meaning, if there is a mediocre performance, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to write specifically about that mediocre performance. Yes, so that you frame it as it really is, as opposed yeah. to taking a mediocre performance and applying my writing methodologies, and all of a sudden, that's a stellar performer. Mm. That's a foul. Right, right, right. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. Clear. All right. So, cause, and, and just, to, just to go back. Now, actually, you said you taught this in the Air Force in many ways. Did, did, were you able to come in contact at your level with some high, you know, very senior level foreign officials or even presidents of our country or whatnot to to uh, express how important this is? Because something tells me you were the only one in the Air Force, maybe even military, that, you know, making this your battle cry. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you know, the everybody recognizes the need and the value of, of writing powerfully. Um, to my knowledge, I'm the only person that's out there teaching this. Um, when, I, when I was in the final manuscript stages of the first edition of the book, 2016-2017, I did all sorts of market research, you know, Barnes and Nobles and, and, and all of that stuff to find out, to determine if there was anything else like it on the market. The answer is no. Mm. Um, several other books will give a tangential mention of stuff like useless words with a paragraph or two or redundancy with a paragraph or two. Not a whole chapter. Not a whole chapter, not the exercises, and, and not the, the writing strategies that I bring to bear. I mean, this is 40 years of crafting stuff for wow. Congress and the White House and how I do it and, and how, you, how you recognize that you need to put the most important information up front. Why? Because knock, 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 I'm busy. Uh, so many people now bury the the most important part in the third or fourth paragraph with all this preliminary yes. was was yes, yes, you've yes. lost the reader yes all right your communication is dead on arrival wow. so you start off with if you only have a good way to think of it if you have a 30 minute presentation for somebody and all of a sudden that person's time gets cut and you're now down to three minutes what's the most important part of that 30 minutes mm. you're going to present you know you got three minutes now so with that mentality, that's how you triage the information that you put the important stuff up front, and then you follow it with uh, the sense. lesser information. People don't write that way. No. No, they meander. They do. Yeah. And everybody's busy.